book of history for the Israelites, for the Hebrew people in the Old Testament. Um, first Samuel is when they first start talking about having a king in, uh, in the Israelite nations. Up to then, they had not had a king, and chaos was beginning to reign, and um, anarchy was beginning to reign, and sin definitely was reigning. And then Samuel comes along. So we're going to uh, go to 1 Samuel chapter 3, where Samuel hears from God the very first time. I had to make sure the other shoe didn't fall off either. Um, so I, I won't go into the whole story of how Samuel came to be at the, at the tabernacle, but Samuel is living with the high priest, who is Eli. And Eli is doing his best, but he's not that great of a guy. And his sons are just awful. And God's had enough. And so God is looking for somebody who would lead his people with integrity. And so Samuel is a little guy. I don't remember how old he is, but he is, um, he's a little guy. Probably my guess would be Jackson's age. That would be my guess. Okay, 10, 11, 12-ish. Okay. Do you remember how old he was? He was 12. Okay, very good. He was 12. Very good. Um, and he's sleeping one night, and he doesn't sleep in the same room as Eli. They have separate rooms. And he's sleeping on the floor, and he, um, and he, and he is awakened with a voice, somebody calling his name. So he runs into Eli. Eli, you called me. No, not me. Go back to bed. You're dreaming. So he goes back to sleep, and pretty soon he hears his name again. Samuel, or maybe it's Samuel, I don't know, and he runs back into Eli, must have been Eli and God have a similar voice because he thought it was Eli, finally Eli figures out what's going on and he says, Samuel, the next time you hear that voice, say these words, speak Lord, your servant is listening, and so we come to verse 10 in 1 Samuel chapter 3. So Samuel went, actually, uh, chapter, or verse 9. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came, stood there, and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel responded, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, I am about to do something in Israel that will cause everyone who hears about it to shudder. And he proceeded to explain to Samuel how things were going to go from bad to worse before they started getting better. Which is not my point. I'm not prophesying that things are about to go from bad to worse around here. My point is this. My point is to invite you to be like Samuel and say to the Lord as we begin worshiping him, not just how awesome he is, although that is a lot of what we'll be singing, but as we worship, God, are you wanting to say something to me this morning? Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And he may do it during our worship time. He may do it during the offering time. You need to give away that $1,000. Let me know if he says that to anybody. Um, <laughs> or he may do it during the message, whatever. He may do it in your heart as you're going home, as he prompts you with something that was said. But God wants to speak to each of us. What is he wanting to say to you this morning? Are you listening? Are you ready to listen and obey? So as we worship, I want to invite you, listen as well as worship this morning. Father, I thank you that you do still speak. Father, you have given us the Holy Spirit in us. Unlike Samuel, Lord, you have placed your Holy Spirit in us. And I pray that as we worship you, your Holy Spirit would speak clearly in our hearts and minds and that you would speak something to us, a word of life, a word of prophecy, a word of knowledge or wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray, God. And in the meantime, I thank you that we have the opportunity to worship you because you are awesome. Amen.
So what else is going on? Well, in four weeks we have Easter. And so I thought I'd start getting us into that mindset is worshiping God, the risen Savior. So this morning, if you would like to join me in worshiping him, go ahead, feel free to stand up and let's worship the Lord this morning together. Greatest day in history, death is beaten, you have rescued me, sing it out, Jesus is alive. Empty cross, empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day, shout it out, Jesus is alive, he's alive. Face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. Endless joy, perfect peace, earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Lead 
us in the song of your salvation. Thank you. Praise you. Glory to you, God. Because of his work on the cross. Because he was born, he died, he rose again. Thank you, Jesus. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope and without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Praise the coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sakes you died Pray. Praise you, Jesus. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. God of glory. Majesty. Praise forever to the King of kings. morning that you rose all of heaven held its breath 
Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father. Praise the Father. Praise the Father. God higher than you. You are the God of gods. Praise you, Jesus. It is good to say that, but it is so much more important that we allow him to be that in our own lives. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb of on his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul sing of
you here this morning, God. Thank you and praise you. You may be seated. I want to spend a moment in prayer. Father God, we come to you, and I'm so thankful that we can gather together to worship you. I'm thankful, God, that you have brought this family together, and I pray for this body of believers that you would draw their hearts to you, that you would speak to us, God, that we would hear from you. Lord, transform our hearts. Help us, God, as we surrender to become more like Jesus. And God, I pray for all those who are worshiping you this morning, who have surrendered their lives to you, who call Jesus Lord. I pray that you would do the same in their churches and their gatherings, God, this morning. Father, we pray, especially for the potter's house, that you would bless and guide them. I pray for their pastor that you would Help him to lead that church with wisdom, with integrity. I pray for his marriage, God, that you would protect and guard it and that you would help him and his wife, Lord, to learn, continue to learn how to love each other and to love their kids. Lord, I pray that you would uh, speak through him this morning and that you would guide whoever's, whoever's preaching, whether it's their pastor or a guest or whatever. God, speak through him. Lord, let them hear from heaven. May they be challenged and encouraged to live out the kingdom here in Blackfoot. Father, I pray for, uh, for the needs of people around this area. I think of a, a lot of people who are without power still. I pray that you would help and bless our, our uh, Idaho power guys, Lord, the, the workers who are working on the wires and all of that. Protect them, please, God. Protect them and help them. Uh, Lord, keep them warm, keep them healthy, give them strength, and give them wisdom to know how to do what needs to be done. Father, I pray for uh, healing on our people. I think of a number of people who are sick or who are stuck at home, and I pray your healing on them, that you would bless and encourage them, that your presence would be encountered there at home as, as much as here, God, that they would encounter you this morning especially those who are, who are watching us online, God, that somehow they would encounter you even, Lord, through the computer or in their home, however that works. God, you, you do what you do. Um, Lord, I pray for healing. I pray for provision. I pray for jobs. I pray that you would meet your people where they are, God. 
God, I am reminded that there are those that we don't know who also need your help. I think of uh, a specific crime, Lord, that some of our folks are connected with, and I, uh, people have died, and people are, are broken and hurting, and I pray that you would be in the midst of that, that you would put your people up there, and that you would bring life out of a, out of a situation that is so full of death destruction the enemy what the enemy is meant for evil that lord you would somehow bring life into that situation Amen. god i pray that you would bring healing to your people here lord whether it is emotional healing or it is physical healing or it is mental healing i pray that you would bring healing to your people here this morning we want to hear from you. We want to know you. We want to encounter you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. What do you want to say to us this morning, Lord? What do you want to say? Give him a moment. Let's, let's do that. Let's just say, God, here I am. I'm listening. What do you want to say, Lord? please join me in hailing and worshiping our Redeemer a little bit more, a little bit more. All hail Redeemer, hail, for you have died for me. His praise and glory shall Lord of all, let every throne before you fall, the King of kings, oh come adore our God who reigns forevermore, praise God who reigns forevermore. so easily distracted. I'm sure others are. I pray that you would help us this morning to turn our focus towards you, our hearts, our minds. Renew our minds, God, as we, as we are here, as we are gathered together, as we hear from you. Renew our minds, Holy Spirit. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for leading us. I am glad to be able to worship with our church family, and I am glad to have so many of our church family back. Um, if you are a parent whose kids have left the nest and then come back, you may understand that feeling. Um, or maybe it's just good to have good friends coming back home to hang out with you, whatever it is. It's good to have... Ron and Sharon back, and Sherry and Ed back, and Byron and Jen back. Um, yeah, it's very good to have our church family together again. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Um, I want to remind you, just, just a reminder, that if you've been attending here for a while, 
three, four, five months or longer, and you feel like God gives you something, and you're like, I think this, is, this, this seems to be something that God wants to share with the whole congregation. The thing about our, our um, movement, the Foursquare movement, what, one of the things that we believe is that God still speaks through His people. That He didn't just stop with the Bible, although anything that we do or say should be seen or listened to through the um, filter of the Word of God, but that God still does speak. And so if you believe that God gives you something to speak to us because you, you've been listening and you're like, I think this is from the Lord, it may just be for you. It may be for all of us. It may be for somebody particular in the congregation. Whatever the case may be, if you feel like you hear from something, I want to invite you, especially if it's during our worship time, because coming up and, and just saying, hey, pastor, I've got something to say is rather interruptive. So if you've got something, if you could go to my wife, Sherry, and say, hey, Sherry, I think I've got something from the Lord. Um, what do you think? And Sherry kind of will kind of... Um, filter that and say, yeah, that seems to be from the Lord, or, or you know, that this may not be the right time, but I think it's something that God is saying. She'll kind of help coach you on that. And if it's from God, if it's something that we all need to hear, then, then we'll hand you the mic, because it may not even be something for us. It may be something for somebody watching online, that they need to hear it. And so, <coughs> whatever the case may be, if God gives you something, please, please let us know. We want to hear from the Lord through his people. Um, I may be the pastor, but I am not the mouthpiece of God. Okay? The day that I become the mouthpiece of God, fire me. <laughs> okay? Um, because God wants to speak through the priesthood of believers. Okay? All right. So, uh, that sermon done. You guys can go home. Maybe not. All right. Uh <sighs> I asked for that. I walked into that. All right, a few announcements. If you are a teenager and you want to go on that camping trip this summer in June 22nd through the 25th, we would love to have you. If you could please give us something financial so that we know that you are wanting to come. You have to be 12 years old or over by June. And um, otherwise, yeah, let us know that you want to be there. That way we know whether to keep planning and, and raising money or we've got three students and we just can't afford to make it happen. Whatever the case may be, we want to, to have wisdom. And so um, if you could give us some sort of financial commitment, that would be great. Uh, also, we are having a fundraiser. Come the end of this month, we are doing something on uh, Thursday and Good Friday. So that would be Maundy Thursday for those of you who are you know come from a liturgical church history background. So Maundy Thursday, Good Friday. That would be the 28th and 29th of March, I believe it is. And so we're going to have a bake sale. If you would like to take part or donate stuff for that, come talk to me or Jen or Sherry. Uh, if you would just like to buy stuff, we will have a sign-up sheet in the very near future. Right, Kayla? Ah, cool. Um, we will have a sign-up sheet in the very near future. All right, so come talk to us. Uh, help us raise money for the kids. We want to do bake sale outside of the church. Okay, um, we want people to buy lots of zucchini bread and Rice Krispies and chocolate chip cookies. And so if you know people that you would like to have uh, buy those things so that you can take their cookies from them, please inform them of that. All right. Ask them to. to yes, ma'am. That would be fantastic. The yeah, tent would probably be good. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, right, yeah. It's going to be beautiful. That's right, because spring is March 21st, and so, yeah, right. All right, thank you. Cool. All right, very good. We will, we will continue to, to talk about that. That's a good idea. I've, I'm a little behind in getting word out, and so that's on me, um, but we will, we will make that happen. Okay, a few other things coming up. If you missed last Friday night, movies at movie night, uh, you missed a really, really deep and profound movie, and, and this time I'm not joking. Um, the Emperor's Club is an amazing movie. I really highly encourage you to take a look-see at it. Um, but coming up, coming up April 4th, I didn't write it down here, but April 4th we'll be doing it again. I think that's the Friday, first Friday of April. Um, no, I don't know what movie it is, but we would love to have you join us if you'd like to. 
Uh, Ladies Connect, March 23rd. Ladies, uh, at my house, without me. So you will be joining Sherry at our house. Love to have you ladies to come and join. 1 o'clock, March 23rd. Put it on your calendars. Um, yeah, I'm sure Sherry will give you more information as time progresses. All right, last announcement. How many of you have ever read through the Bible in a year? Anyone? Okay, good. How many of you have just read through the Bible? Three years, two years, whatever. Okay, very good. Excuse me. In Sunday school, we're going to be doing that. We're going to take, and it won't be every verse of the Bible, but it'll be most of the Bible, and it's um, been edited into story form. So we're going to take the New International Version, and it's all scripture, so there's no, nobody's come along and said, hey, let's add this story or that story. None of that. It's just scripture and then reading it as a story. So we're going to be doing that starting in April. If you would like to join us, that's Sunday school, 9 o'clock. Uh, we'll be going through scripture over the next year. Okay? If everything works well, Paul gets his ducks in a row and doesn't get sick or anything like that, we should hit Christmas time about the time we hit Christmas time. So that's the goal. Okay? And then um, and then we'll finish up uh, in 2025. So if you'd like that, there's a sign up sheet. Huh? No, no, starting in April, after Easter. Okay? So there's a sign sign up sheet in the back if you would like to purchase that. Um, this is not a, a moneymaker or anything. This is not a fundraiser. We're not getting a dollar a book or anything. Um, this is just our cost if you can if you want to purchase one of those. If you want to go on Amazon and buy it yourself, you're more than welcome to. Um, yeah, so that's that's coming up in April, Sunday school, 9 o'clock on Sundays. Yeah, yeah, if you prefer audio or Kindle, that's that's an option, and they are cheaper than what we've got back there, okay? All right, that's what's coming up. Um, I want to invite you, uh, now, now I'm putting aside the, the humor, I want to invite you, if you would like to worship the Lord through giving, there are a couple buckets in the back that you could do so. Um, I want to encourage you that this is a form of worship. This is not something where I'm, I'm coming down and saying, we need money, or golly, I need a new car, or anything of that nature. This is, or even the fact that, that we need something for the church. This is, we want to worship God. We want to give back to God a little bit of what he has given to us. And so if that is you, if you would like to worship God that way, uh, you can do so in the, the, there's buckets in the back. You can text to give. See, i got to prep Kayla for this because she doesn't know I'm going to say that. That's not her fault. There we go. You can text to give, or you can go to our website at harvestfoursquare.org and click on the Give button there. Yes, there is a little bit of setup for both of those things. But once you're set up, it's pretty easy. So if you would like to worship God in that way, um, feel free to do so. Okay? All right. Kids, are we ready to go? Maybe a better question is, Jen, are you ready to go? That's unusual. Usually it's the other way around. <laughs> Jeremy has something? Okay. All right. Very good. You want to do it now, Jeremy, before the kids leave or after the kids leave? Okay. Well, let's, let's go ahead and pray over the kids and send them down. Um, and, then, and then while you go ahead and come up, okay? Let's pray for our, chi for our children. You can, you can take that with you, but it's okay. Father God, we thank you for our kids for the blessing that they are. And we ask you, please, to give Jen wisdom to know how to uh, teach. I pray that you would anoint her, God, that you would empower her and her team in Jesus' name. And Lord, would you please continue to raise up others to come alongside her and help her. And, and um, God, we would love to see two or three classes down there. Uh, full of kids. And so, Lord, we will trust you to bring that about. In the meantime, we pray your anointing on Jen, and we pray that your presence would be there and that the kids would hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Kids, go ahead. And uh, Jeremy, here you go, buddy. Yeah, you do have to use a microphone. I'll hold it for you, though. <coughs> Afraid so. Yep. All right. So, Jeremy believes he has something from the Lord for us. So, Please listen up. As, as I was as I was sitting back there and uh, we were worshiping, uh, especially one of the songs that you sang that uh, kind of uh, all the songs actually, but um, 
I was uh, thinking about what I just went through and what my mom's dealing with right now. She's having a whole bunch of her sisters in the church back there uh, coming with her, and they delivered a whole bunch of food and uh, for her so she didn't have to cook. And and even uh, <coughs> even right now in the uh, current storm we're having, uh, and I know there's people with power out and people whose power just came on or they're still out, but they were able to get out and do stuff. And God, it, it's just, I was, as I was sitting back there and praying and thinking that this is, something tangible that we can see that and God was saying see I am still at work even in the midst of the storm I am there with you it may not get answered or the problem may not get taken care of right away but I am work I am with you I am working on your thank you thank you very much Jeremy God sometimes just likes to let me know that I'm on the right track. And, and hearing Jeremy, I'm going, oh, yeah, that's exactly what the Lord has given me. Um, but I hope that you hear it as well, that God is at work even in the storm, even in this storm. Lord, I know it's winter, but please can we be done? God is at work. He is still with you. He loves you, and he hasn't left you alone. Jeremy, that is a fantastic word from God. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, for those of you who don't know, Jeremy's dad died mid-February. Was it only two weeks ago? Dang, feels like it was longer. Okay, yeah, so Jeremy's dad died two weeks ago. And God is caring for his mom uh, in a variety of ways through their church family. So, um, thank you, Jeremy. I want to pray for, for your, you and your mom right now. Okay, bud? Father, I lift up Jeremy, his family, to you. I pray that you would continue to uphold them, strengthen them. Lord, I pray that you would provide Jeremy with all that he needs and that you would encourage his mom. And Lord, as she, uh, she transitions to this new life, this new chapter, would you be her strength? I pray that your presence would be felt this morning in her home and at her church where she is, that she would know that you are with her. Lord, I thank you that you have shown and reminded Jeremy that you are with him, and I pray that each of us could know that, God, this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Um, God has spoken a few things this morning. I hope that you have gotten something, but if you haven't, maybe God's got something for you in the message that he has asked me to prepare and put together. Um, if you are watching online, we'd like to say hello. Glad you're here. Um, if you're watching later, either way, watching online now or later, uh, it's good to have you. And may the Lord give you a word from him as well. Uh, whether it is from through me or through something else that's gone on this morning. <coughs> As most of you know, we have been going through Richard Dahlstrom's book, Forest Faith. And we're coming to the end because Easter is coming, and I, I'm not going to continue the book while Easter... Anyway, so we're coming to the end of the book, and um, we, we've got a few concepts that Pastor Richard has mentioned to us such as cultivating our faith through spiritual practices, practicing thankfulness in order to be able to give God's kingdom to others, how we must be rooted in God's word, God's love, and in our identity in Christ. God is wanting to teach us about these things, and I hope that you have received something ar around those, those subjects and, um, and that you have become closer to God, and maybe more, a little bit more like Christ in the process. Now, two weeks ago, my sermon was titled, A Rooted and Flexible Life. And if you're a note taker, if you're someone who likes to take notes and, and 
uh, study it afterwards or anything of that nature. Today my sermon is cut, titled, The Intertwining of Our Roots. So, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak through me. Father, I pray that you would anoint me, empower me. Lord, that I would have the gift to teach from the Holy Spirit. Um, and would you please speak to us your words of life and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. If you have been here longer than a week, you probably know, well, it's two weeks because I didn't preach last week. You probably know that I am a Tolkien fan, Lord of the Rings, uh, not just the movies, but the books, uh, The Hobbit, all of that. And in that series, there is a, c a few characters called the Ents and the Horns and then the Trees. So the Ents are shepherds and the Horns are kind of their shepherdings, the, the Anyway, I won't, ex I won't explain it. Anyway, the point being is that these ants and trees and horns all talk to each other, okay? And they all look like trees. And um, I think, do we have a, a picture of an ant up there, Byron? Maybe? There we go. That is, um, that's Fangorn or Treebeard, okay? Or at least New Line Cinema's version of him. I found a couple others that were interesting also. And they talk to each other. And the ants shepherd the trees, and the trees, so th during the movie, and, and in the, um, actually not during the movie, unless you got the extended edition, but in the book, the ants actually send trees and horns to the Battle of Helm's Deep. And they, they go down to the bottom of the valley, okay, and Helm's Deep's at the top of the valley, and the good guys chase the bad guys, the orcs, all the way down into the trees. And the orcs are never seen again, and the, and the trees... And it's really cool because the trees, trees just kind of travel through the dirt, wading like you would wade through water that's about knee deep. It's a cool effect. Anyway, if you haven't seen the movie, um, you can go watch it. So <coughs> now in the real world, in reality, we still s are re discovering that trees do talk to each other. Now, you could argue that they're not conscious, they're not sentient, they're not like us. They're not thinking it through, although some people think they are. But let me, let me read to you, in the last 20 plus years, some of the research that's been discovered. This is from an interview with uh, Peter Wollobin, a German forester, and, and the interview takes place in uh, Smithsonian Magazine. He says this, some are calling it the wood wide web, says Wollobin in a German accented English. All the trees here, they're in Germany, in, in for this interview. And in every forest that is not too damaged are connected to each other through underground fungal networks. Trees share water and nutrients through the networks and also use them to communicate. They send distress signals about drought and disease, for example, or insect attacks, and other trees alter their behavior when they receive these messages. Scientists call these mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal, networks. Yeah, I'm not going to try. The fine hair-like root tips of trees join together with microscopic fungal filaments to form the basic links of the network, which appears to operate as a symbiotic relationship betre between trees and fungi, or perhaps an economic exchange. As a kind of fee for services, the fungi consume about 30% of the sugar that the trees photosynthesize from sunlight. The sugar is what fuels the fungi as they scavenge the soil for nitrogen phosphorus, and other mineral nutrients, which are then absorbed and consumed by the trees. So we got the symbiotic relationship going on, but what's fascinating is that the trees, through the fungi, are communicating with each other. It is so cool. So when Sherry and I went down to visit Benjamin, um, we took a trip down to the Redwoods, and I heard all about this for the first time down there with our tour guide, and he was telling us how the Redwoods do the same thing. They've got this fungi that's on their roots, and if something happens to this tree over here, like say a, a bug starts to invade it and kill it or whatever, um, the tree will actually send signals through the fungi to the other trees, and the other trees will develop some sort of defense mechanism against that bug. I don't know how all the science works, but it's fascinating. And, and I, I actually posted this article to come up tomorrow night in uh, Facebook. So if you're on the face church Facebook page, um, you can read the rest of the article. Or just look up trees in Smithsonian Magazine, whatever. But it's fascinating some of the other ways that trees communicate with each other, both through their roots and through other methods. Um, 
And those same root systems not only help them communicate, but those same root systems also help them stand in the midst of storms. So something else we discovered about cedar trees, and this I kind of knew, cedar trees, fir trees, hemlock, those trees, the big ones, so when we build a building, the taller we want the building, the deeper we have to go for the foundation. Most of us understand that. But with trees, that's not necessarily true. With trees, it's more a matter of the, de- the taller the tree gets, the more spread out the roots get. Yes, they do have some depth. depth. Um, the article I read about this said, yeah, they only go five or six feet deep. And I went, I've tried to dig five or six feet deep in the soil around here. That's still a long ways, in my opinion. But, but they spread out rather than going deep. And as they spread out, they intertwine their roots so that if you have a forest or even a small grove of trees, they are able to stand the taller they get. And they've been known to have root systems that go out many feet beyond their drip line because they're going up and these trees are getting interconnected. And those roots help to hold them together. So you've got the roots, they're communicating through the roots, they're being held up by the roots, they're intertwining. Part of, there is a point to all of this. I mean, it's really cool science, but there is a point. Part of our vision as a church is that we would build community. Now, we do also have part of, as part of our vision that we would serve our community, which I, I say serve our city because, you know, in a saying like that, you don't want to say community twice because it sounds funny. So serve our city. But, yes, we do want to serve our city, but we want to build community. And as people join us, we embrace them and bring them on and endeavor to continue to build a bigger and bigger community. And by community, I mean, well, I'll explain what I mean. We as Christians must not only attend church, but we must engage with and build an interconnected root system with each other as we follow Christ. And if we refuse to do that, now there's a difference between refusing and just learning how, but if we refuse, if we say, no, no, I don't need the church or I don't need to build uh, interconnected, I can do life on my own, and we just choose to attend, then we are not following Christ. We're just being a part of a religious club. Now, that said, I know that there are people, and probably some here, who have, who have experienced churches that were toxic, that were poisonous, that were dangerous, where bad things happened. And there was no repentance, no I'm sorry, no I have hurt you, I am, I am wrong. Instead it was gaslighting and, and pushing away and all of that. I get that, that that happens. And so I don't want to say blindly follow me or anybody. But to say to you that that happens does not negate the fact that Christ has called us to be interconnected. It just means that those people weren't following Christ well. It's a different sermon for another time. That said, Paul calls us in Scripture to live interconnected lives. And while I'll also often say that we are a family, Paul uses a different analogy as well. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, verse 4 through 5 say this, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Recognize, when Paul wrote that letter to the Romans, these were small little churches, house churches, that were gathering together, and they were starting to divide amongst each other Jews and Gentiles, legal people who were, who were saying, I'm going to follow the Old Testament law to the letter, and people who were saying, I am so free in Christ, I can do anything I want. And Paul was writing this letter to the Romans in part, yes, to bring correction, but also to say, look, folks, I get it. 
You come from different backgrounds and different religious experiences, but we're still called to love each other. We are a body, even amongst different house churches. You can't just say, well, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong... No! Even when we disagree about important biblical issues, Christ is the unifying factor in all of it. And we need to learn to love each other even when we disagree. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul goes even deeper and stronger. Again in chapter 12, which I thought was coinkadink. Anyway, chapter 12, verses 14 through 21 of the first letter he wrote to the Corinthians. Listen to this. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell? But our bodies have many parts. And God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. And all of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. (coughs) We are called to be a part of of the body of Christ. In a local context like this, in a community context, a city context, and in a global context. But especially I want to speak to the local expression and how we build relationships and intertwine our roots. Because we are called as a local expression to intertwine our roots together. The writer of Hebrews and Pastor Richard have both got some things to say about this. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. He, um, oh, back up. So, Pastor Richard has two things. Yeah, you got to read your notes and then come back to them. Uh, Pastor Richard has two things. I added a third and a fourth. How can we intertwine our roots? So Pastor Richard has two, and the first one he says is we must learn to encourage one another. And the writer of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews chapter 10, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Richard explains it this way. He's telling the story of a friend who was very encouraging and who habitually encouraged everyone they met. And he says this when he asked his friend, how can you be so encouraging like that? And his friend said, most people already know where they fall short in their lives. There are plenty of people willing to point that out. There aren't many people pointing out where other people are doing right or what natural talents they have. People need that, and I can give it. So I do. I didn't put this in my notes, so hopefully I can remember it. But this was such a a light bulb moment for me. There was somewhere around the United States a weather lady who was overweight. And there were people one day, I don't remember, I think she mentioned she was going on a diet or something. She was joking with her people about it on screen, I mean on on TV, live TV, and she got, as you know, social media can be a killer, and she just got a ton of emails and social media, you are fat, you are such a bad example, how could you say something like that, blah, 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 and just came down and attacked her. So with the permission from her producer, after she gave the weather report, she said, now I'd like to speak to those of you who have written in and told me how overweight I am. And while I would like to say thank you, I didn't realize that. The reality is I know it quite well. And I am working on it. I didn't need your help. 
or I didn't, and I didn't need you to tear me down and tell me how bad I am. I know it. I'm working on it. And when I, I heard that, and I don't remember the context or anything of that nature, but it so struck me because it was such the opposite of what God calls us to do and what everybody needs. People don't need us to tell them that they're living in sin. 95% of them already know it. They may not know Jesus is the answer, but they know, yes, what I am doing, I shouldn't be doing. Yes, I understand this, I am broken and hurting. Yes, I get it. What they need is somebody to tell them, here's where you can find hope. Here is what you are doing right. Here is how I, I want to encourage you and tell you this is what I see that God is doing in you. That is one way that we can intertwine our roots. Second way we can intertwine our roots is to serve each other like Jesus. Even the down and dirty jobs we don't want to do. Even those we don't want to serve, who don't really deserve it. Jesus sets the example, and he sets it pretty high. John chapter 13. They have gathered for the Passover supper. And part of the, tr of the culture of the time, because they were walking either barefoot or in sandals, as most of you know, if you know anything about the culture of the time, you know that they were walking in the, in the dirt, in the grime, in the mud. The weather was irrelevant. You had to walk, because unless you were wealthy, in which case you had a horse, so all the wealthy had horses walking the streets, and you can imagine what came out of them. And so the rest of the people had to walk in that. Okay. So culture had it that when you went to somebody's house, in order to not be tracking that stuff all around, not only would you take your sandals off, but there would be a servant, the lowest servant of the household who would wash your feet. Especially if you were wealthy, you'd have several servants. And low man on the totem pole got that job. And yet, when Jesus gathers his disciples, nobody does that. And so, in John chapter 13, Jesus, when he had finished washing their feet, and, and, and the first part of the chapter talks about how Jesus did that and the response and all of that. But when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And he said, do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. He set a pretty high bar because you know who was, amid, who was there still? Not just Peter, who would deny him, but Judas, who would betray him, was a part of that group. It would be easy to say, well, Peter denied him, but he came back, and Jesus knew about that. But to know that Jesus washed the dirt and the horse poop and all of the junk off of Judas's feet, even though he knew that within a few hours Judas was going to, to not just deny him, but betray him. And yet Jesus washed his feet. I think that sets a pretty high bar for how we are called to serve others, even if we don't like them, we disagree with them, we think that they don't deserve it, they've hurt us badly. We'll get to that in a minute. We're still called. Richard put it this way in his book. It's about whether you see the other, whoever the other is in, for you, in your life as someone worth the investment of time, money, and emotional energy. For too many of us, our plates are so full of pursuits having to do with our own well-being that we have nothing left for those in need. Those who see the eyes of Jesus, those who see with the eyes of Jesus, will be empowered to respond with the heart of Jesus. And when this happens, they will become servants. They'll all be serving different people in different ways, following in the footsteps of the one who had room in his life for disruption and unanticipated opportunities for service.
We are not all called to serve everyone, but all of us can serve each other in some way, shape, or form. Encourage, serve, and if we want to continue to be intertwined, we must learn to forgive. Jesus seemed to think this was pretty important when he said this in Matthew chapter 6. For if you forgive other people for their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people, then your Father will not forgive your offenses. Paul in Colossians 3.13 said, Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive, this gets me, Forgive as quickly and completely as the Master forgave you. I want you to think of everything you have done to earn God's forgiveness. And then realize that's what we're called to do for others. Not in our own strength. The positive is that Jesus doesn't say, forgive others. Good luck. (laughs) But instead, he says, I am calling you to live out my kingdom and I am empowering you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, if you need to forgive, you, I don't find it easy to do without the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't find it easy to do at all. But I certainly don't do it well without the Holy Spirit's empowerment, without saying, God, help me. This person has hurt me. And sometimes saying that multiple times a day for years. Forgiveness is a huge topic. I've preached on it before, like for months. <laughs> so I'm not going to bra- I'm not going to give, you know, uh, um, a, a an expansive overview of of forgiveness and all that it entails because I know that it involves hurt and pain and woundedness. But let me give you a few things about forgiveness. A few clarifications. Number 1, forgiveness does not mean sweeping whatever was done under the rug. It is not saying it's okay or it's no big deal. It did hurt, and your pain matters. Forgiveness is not denying that. In fact, I often will tell people when I say I'm sorry, and they say, hey, don't worry about it. No, really. Please, forgive me. Because it is a big deal. Similarly, this doesn't mean that people shouldn't be held accountable for their hurtful, unjust, or just plain wrong actions. God also is a God of justice. He is a God of grace, he's a God of forgiveness, but he's also a God of justice. And if somebody has hurt you, there may be a place to say there needs to be justice. God gave rules about how justice was to be administered in the the Israeli uh, Hebrew culture um, back in the Old Testament. So there is a place for justice. What forgiveness is about is giving up your right to retaliate. Or hurt them back. There's a difference between retaliation and justice. Forgiveness does mean you may need to let them know they've hurt you. There's nothing more frustrating than, (laughs) some of you may have heard this saying growing up, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. That's not helpful. (laughs) I remember getting on the bus in junior high and this girl that I really respected, she was like a ninth grader and I was a seventh grader. And uh, this wasn't a case of romantic interest. This was a girl that I really respected, a, a girl from my youth group. And man, she was giving me the cold shoulder. She was giving me the evil eye. Jim, what did I do wrong? And she gave me that. If you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. Oh. How are you, what are you supposed to do with that, especially as a seventh grader? What are you supposed to do if they won't tell you? All you can do is say, I'm sorry, and pray that something happens to break that ice. But on the flip side, if you're the person hurt, don't assume they know. Okay? Finally, for more on what forgiveness is and isn't, and how to do it biblically, I encourage you to read, what it's, it's, when it comes to forgiveness, my favorite book to read is by a guy named John Bevere, and it's called The Bait of Satan, because bitterness and unforgiveness is just that. It's the bait of Satan. It's what Satan throws out there, and he says, how can I hook him? 
And that is one of his key ways to do it. Unforgiveness, bitterness, because it doesn't do anything to the person that you are doing, you, that, you, that hurt you. It does it all inside of you. And God's saying, I've got more for you than that. <laughs> Encourage people. Serve people. Forgive people. Finally, in order to build relationship and intertwine our roots, we must commit to doing so. <coughs> I know that sounds simple and kind of trite, but we've got to commit to it. We can't just say, I'm going to be a Lone Ranger Christian. We live in a consumeristic culture. We live in a culture that says, consume everything you want, and if you get tired of it, if you don't like the taste anymore, if it's not so good looking anymore, if they just make you bored anymore, move on. Get out of that relationship. But God says, no, no, we are to do something different. We are called to enter into relationship, to intertwine our roots, even when it's messy and hard, and even when it hurts. Because you know what? Sometimes it does. Sometimes we hurt each other. You've heard me say it before, and I will say it again and again because I have to remind myself. If I haven't offended you yet, you haven't been here long enough. Because I will. Not because I set out to do so. I'm not a sadist. I just know me. I am human. And if you haven't offended somebody in this church, you haven't been here long enough. I'm not suggesting you get it out of the way. But we often have a what's in it for me attitude. How can I receive something? The church is all about get something out of it. You should be blessing me. The pastor should be doing this and doing that for me, me, me. And if you think that's what church is about, I want to bring gentle correction and say, you're wrong. No, I want to bring correction and say, we are about loving, serving, encouraging, and forgiving each other. We're not a consumeristic. It's not even about the, this church in particular. Followers of Christ, the kingdom of God is not, what can I get out of it? But how can I do these things? How can I be Jesus to others? How can I become more like Jesus? One of my pastor friends used to say, God didn't invite you to become a Christian to make you happy. He invited you into a relationship with him in order to make you more like Jesus. And quite frankly, sometimes uh, that won't make you happy. <laughs> we are created to live and grow in wisdom and understanding of our relationship with Jesus by living in community. And, it, and we simply can't become more like Jesus by doing it alone. We've got to enter in community. We've got to intertwine our roots. And that will take wor work, it will take time, and it will take commitment. So what I wrote down here was, if you think this is about attending church, you're missing the point. If it were just about attending, then we could just be another club. Which, statistically speaking, clubs are a dying breed. I mean, the Rotary Club, the Lions Club, those are all... The, even the bowling clubs, they're all starting to slowly pass away. Not, I'm not saying it's happening, you know, tomorrow, but over time, statistically speaking. And so if we just wanted a club, we too would be passing away. But we're not a club. We are a gathering of a body and a family. And God has placed everyone here for a reason and a purpose. And when you aren't here, whether you're not here for good reason, I'm not sure going to Hawaii without the rest of us was a good reason, but if you're not here for good reason or bad, you are missed. You are, you are, we are not receiving from you and you're not receiving from us. And that's, like I said, that's not necessarily bad. That could be a good thing because you're off with other family or you're visiting another church or whatever the case may be. But to say, I don't need you, is a lie from hell. You and I need each other in some way, shape, or form. And if you are a part of this body and you're not here, I'm missing out. You're missing out. With this in mind, I, wanted, I want to ask you to have, to, to, to look at two options, two, not options, two opportunities of things you can do. Number one, this is an invitation to all of you. 
take another step in your commitment to this body. If you think this is where God has called you to plant and intertwine your roots, then, then let's do it. Let's intertwine. Let's find ways to do things. That may mean the, the official membership, and sometime in April I'll be talking about that and what that means. It could mean a financial commitment. It could mean finding a way to serve others here. It could be finding others to invite to become part of our family. Or it could just be that you find ways to bring God's kingdom into our midst and into the midst of the people of Blackfoot. But it's how can we take another step? Not how can we become perfect church people. How can we become, how can we all be, the, the joke from the 70s still is popular. How can we all gather together, hug, and say kumbaya? Or sing kumbaya? And most of you don't even remember how that song goes. Okay? But that's not the point. The point is that that's not what we're called to. We are called, yes, we can gather together and hug each other if we want to, but we're called to serve, love, encourage, and forgive and become more like Christ together. So what's the next step you can take in that regard? Or the other opportunity you have is to find ways to serve, to encourage, and maybe to forgive. Maybe you need to forgive somebody. Maybe you need to ask forgiveness of somebody. Whatever step is needed to bring healing to a relationship, if our roots are intertwined, maybe that needs to occur so that we can continue to become more like Christ together. So what I want you to hear is not that you need to be here every Sunday. And it's certainly not that you need to um, you need to be good friends with everybody. Okay, because as we do grow, when Sherry and I were attending Grace Harvest in Moses Lake, we probably only were good friends with what would you say one percent, maybe two. Okay. I don't expect you to be good friends with everybody. And I don't expect you to agree with everybody. Being in unity does not mean we are in lockstep. But it does mean that we are looking for ways, however God prompts us, to encourage, serve, and love each other. As both a symbolic and a spiritual way of doing that, one of the things that we do is we celebrate communion together. And so this morning, I want to close by celebrating communion. So, yeah, please. And, and Sharon, would you mind? No, I know, I didn't ask. Sorry. I forgot. <laughs> so one of the things people often have to forgive me for is that I sometimes forget to communicate. Okay, it's time to come up. <laughs> Tempting, but I probably shouldn't do that. It's hard on the microphone. Right, yes. So um, so one of the ways that we bring community is we celebrate communion. So what we're going to do is um, mom and dad are going to stand up here, and they're going to have the elements. If you've never taken communion before, basically what you're doing is you're going to... Um, Come up, you're going to have, mom's going to give you a piece of bread. My dad's going to give you a, or you're going to take a little cup. And these two things are spiritually symbolic of Christ's body and blood. And I'll explain a little bit of that. But what we do is you'll come up, you'll take those things, and then you'll go back to your seat and you'll wait. And then we'll all partake together. And there's reasons for all of that. I'm not going to go into it right now, but that's, that's the gist of communion. So if you could come up, Sharon's going to play. I'm going to um, step back. And if you guys could just make a circle around this way. Um, actually, yeah, do it this way. 
and down there, go back around that way. Um, let's go ahead and, and get the elements, and then, and then we'll partake together, okay? So come on up, and I'm going to get out of the way. In this letter to the Corinthians, in his first letter to the Corinthians, as I said, Paul explains how we are a body in chapter 12. But if you turn back a chapter, a little bit earlier in the letter, remember the, the chapters weren't there in the original, they were just put there afterwards so we can help find the places. A little bit earlier in the letter, Paul, in chapter 11, explains the whole point of communion and, and how to take communion because the people were taking it rather selfishly and self-centeredly. And so going back to that spot, I've kind of broken it down, and I want to I want to invite you to take communion with me reading this together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23, starting in verse 23, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Allow me to pray and thank God for his body for us. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus to die in our place so that we could walk in relationship with you. Thank you. And thank you, Jesus, that you suffered and died in our place, your body broken for us to start a new relationship with our living God and Creator. Let's partake together. Paul continues, in the same way, also, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's remember Christ together. Jesus, thank you for the blood that you shed to pay for us, to pay for our sins, to pay for our rebellion, and to make us right with God. You your righteousness in us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's partake together.
every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. And then Paul says this in his letter to the Colossians. He says in chapter 3, your old life is dead. Your new life, your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with, with Christ in God. He is your life. When Christ, your real life, remember, shows up again on this earth, you'll show up too. The real you. The glorious you. I want to close with a prayer sort of inspired by Richard's prayer at the end of that chapter. Please join me in praying. Christ around me. I'm connected to every member of this particular expression of your body and in a larger sense to the Christian church in Blackfoot and around the world. Grant that I might have eyes to see my connection with each person to the end that I might serve and encourage and give and receive, weaving my life into the fabric of the other lives you bring my way. Though it will require energy and risk and some pain, no doubt, I believe it is your desire and far, far better than being a tree alone on a hill. Take me there by your grace. Amen. Now, may the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.